speaker today for our third CSIRO um, webinar or co video conference is Dr. Mark Pierce with the CSIRO and a group leader in our organisation. And here I'm not going to just read his bio and the abstract, so we'll just pass it over to Mark to um, unmute and start sharing his screen, hopefully. And just I, the other thing I wanted to say before we get started, if for those of you that haven't seen these before, uh, there's a chat panel on the side. If you would like to ask questions at the end, there'll be time to, to ask my questions. Just type your question in there or, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll be asking those anonymously anyway. And, and we will be making this presentation uh, available on YouTube in about two weeks' time. And for those of you that don't know, um, the first two webinars have also been made available on YouTube. So look out for those links on my LinkedIn profile, but also we'll try and get them out there in other places as well. Okay, yes, th uh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, welcome to the, the uh, video conference. So if everyone could just uh, mute their microphones, that would be great. Just one more request before we get started. So I'm going to talk today about um, you, the use of crystallography in, in studying ore deposits. And I, um, I called it the other half of the story because in, in thinking about what to talk about, I thought we, we often talk a lot about applying geochemistry or geophysics to, uh, to study ore deposits and in exploration. And the, the link between these two, these two things, chemistry and geophysics, is actually the minerals themselves that are within the ore deposits. And the, um, the crystallography of these minerals uh, plays a, a controlling role in a lot of the, the processes and a lot of the things that we observe um, in, that we use as, as vectors to ore deposits. And also in the things like processing um, and how we deal with the ore deposits. So, my first slide, as, as with all good presentations, is a kind of why do we care? And part of that, part of the story is um, is about how the crystallography of, of minerals controls a whole bunch of, of the properties. So obviously, the density is related to the minerals that we have in the rocks. Things like the seismic properties uh, related to the elastic properties of the minerals, uh, which themselves are a function of the crystallography. And we can see this top figure here is, is a figure from this really nice review paper on how we can use microstructural observations of, of rocks to actually model the, the elastic and, and seismic properties. And you can see not only can we predict things like the, the P weight velocity in these rocks, but we can also um, we can also model how how that velocity varies as a as a function of as a method of foliation or the seismic anisotropy. So we can really start using these observations to drill down and, and understand the things that we might use in terms of uh, remote sensing and, and, um, and also potential fields. So magnetic susceptibility, um, the plot here, whilst the susceptibility itself is not necessarily controlled um, by the, the, the crystallography per se, this data set from Jim Austin's work on uh, magnetite and hematite from the Horseshoe Range shows that this, um, this subset of the data here, uh, um, where the, the Koenigsberg ratio was actually affected by the, um, the way that the magnetite grains are being replaced by the hematite, and that the magnetite is being dissected into much smaller grains, which cause um, the magnetic properties to change while still maintaining relatively high magnetic susceptibility. The, the crystallography of, of minerals also controls what crystallographic sites we have and therefore what trace elements we can substitute into these, um, into these minerals that we have. And understanding the evolution of different, different minerals um, and how, how we kind of react one to another actually um, can, can give us an idea of the trace element budgets and where these elements might be sitting. The, um, 
the relationships between between minerals can also influence the way that the reactions happen. So things like epitaxial growth, which I'll talk quite a lot about later, um, is actually very important in terms of how we affect the, um, the, the reactions that we see in a lot of ore deposits. And obviously, we can start looking at uh, things like processing, grain size and phase relationships become um, very important. If the, if the people who've just joined us could use their microphones, that'd be great because we're getting a little bit of feedback. So that's kind of the why and the outline for the talk is, is shown here. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about the tools that we can use for, for looking at um, mineral crystallography and, and focus on electron backscatter diffraction, which has been around for quite a while now, but there's, there's not a whole lot of, of data recorded on ore deposits. And I think there's a lot of processes that go on during ore deposit formation that could benefit from a, a deeper look with, with this particular technique and the, the kind of ideas that I'm going to talk about today. And then I'll talk about how we interpret that data um, and kind of make sense of it. Then I'll go through the idea of the phase heritage and the talk about a couple of case studies of, of work that I've done with, uh, with collaborators looking at um, firstly zircons and um, how then we can apply those ideas to understand the evolution of, of TiO2 phases in ore deposits. And then I'll look at uh, epitaxial growth and, um, and talk about some, some data that I've got from, from gold uh, mica relationships. Um, from Western Australia, and, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions, hopefully, afterwards. So the tools that we can use for looking at um, mineral uh, crystallography are largely based around the concept of diffraction. And so we, this takes advantage of the, the regular repeating crystalline structure of the minerals. So we can use X-ray diffraction um, to look at, and it's particularly good for looking at things like clays. We can look at uh, we can look at chemical variation by substitution and how the diffraction patterns change. We can also do in situ experiments, and, and at CSIRO we have a really nice lab in Melbourne for doing experiments in situ where we can heat things up and look at how the how the reactions um, occur because we can track the different minerals that um, that, that come and go as they react and is this idea of a distribution function where we can actually analyze amorphous material. We can use the same kind of physics to look at how electrons are diffracted. And there's, there are various TEM based techniques um, to look at electron diffraction. And we can get very accurate, uh, accurate results in um, very specific uh, sites. The technique that I've spent a lot of time working with um, since my PhD is electron backscatter diffraction and that's an SEM based technique where we, um, this is a diagram here, so the incident electron beam within the SEM hits the surface of the sample which we tilt to, to 70 degrees um, to aid the exit of the electrons and those electrons interact with the minerals and some of the lattice planes will, will diffract and the diffraction causes the, the electrons to, to exit the sample um, in this kind of band pattern in a very, very similar way to the way we get peaks on an, an X-ray diffraction spectrum. So um, let me look at, look at this in a bit more detail. So, in, for a particular spot, we have not one diffracting lattice plane, but a whole set. And this gives us our Kikuchi pattern. And this is a rather old and um, somewhat kind of faded looking um, pattern now. But you can see that it's made up of a whole host of these bands. And these all correspond to different sets of lattice planes that are diffracting within that particular spot. And by comparing this particular pattern to a library of minerals that we've, we've told the software is in the rock and um, it can give us the the phase that we're looking at and also the orientation of that phase so the orientation of the crystal lattice with respect to the sample so 
it, it indexes the patterns, and these are the crystallographic directions um, within this particular pattern that the, the model has produced. And um, so the first idea of, of using this data is to create a map of these orientations and also these phases. And this is a, a figure from Dave Pryor's paper from 1999 on how we use these measurements to create a, a raster. So we take a regular grid of measurements. You can see here we have a pattern at each, each point. And um, as we go along, we have different, uh, a different phase encountered for some of these points. And we can then map out where the phases are and we can map out changes, slight changes in the orientation of these patterns um, between the different points. So this is a data set here, which shows us uh, pyrite grains from actually from Sunrise Dam gold deposit. And this is colored by orientation. And we can see that within a single pyrite grain um, here, we have very uniform, very uniform color. And this is telling us that the crystal lattice is all in the same orientation within that grain. Um, and that there isn't much lattice distortion, the kind of thing that you'd see as angelose extinction if you were looking um, in, an, in an optical micrograph. As we go across a grain boundary, we come into a, another, another grain here, which is again all of the same orientation. And because we have the orientation at each point, um, we can start looking at um, looking in uh, at stereographic projections of those orientations. You'll notice that uh, in the background there's this grayscale image, and this is actually a measure of the the, the quality of the uh, EBSD pattern. And it's it's brighter where the patterns are good, and it's worse where the patterns are bad. And you can see it nicely picks out things like um, grain boundaries within these phases here. So we actually get a lot of information from this, uh, from this uh, technique about the microstructure of our rocks. So if we plot that data um, on, um, on as, a, as a stereographic projection, um, we can start to look at the kind of the angular relationships between these different phases. And this is data for, for ilmenite. And we can see um, here that we have ilmenite is trigonal. And so we have this, the C axis, the 0001 planes, and these all cluster on the stereographic projection over here. These are upper, upper hemisphere projections. So this is um, kind of pointing to the right and up out of the plane of the, the page. So um, just as you kind of see on a, on a steering net. Now we, we have the A directions and the M directions also plotted. And because uh, ilmenite is trigonal, we actually get three of each of these directions. So um, we've got one C axis, but we have three. And that's because of the threefold symmetry around the, the C axis. And this kind of introduces the idea of symmetric equivalence in these, um, in these minerals. So we can't tell whether we're looking at this A direction, whether we're looking at this one, or whether we're looking at this one, they're all treated the same. And so this introduces um, a kind of multiplicity to a lot of the data that actually becomes important when we, when we start analyzing what we see in the minerals. Another concept that um, I'm going to talk about and is the concept of misorientation. And this is, um, this is the angle needed to rotate two, two objects into the same orientation. Um, so if we start off with this um, rather oddly shaped block here, this is from John Wheeler's uh, paper in 2001, which goes through many of these uh, concepts. We, wrote, we have to rotate it by 80 degrees in order for it to be in the same orientation as this, this block over here. And similarly, 24 degrees and 35 degrees for these different orientations. And these misorientations are given as, as an angle about a particular axis. And that axis can be um, in the sample space. So it could be a kind of XYZ Cartesian axis, 
or we can think of it in terms of an axis within the crystal. Now, because we, we, can, we can plot these up um, spatially, because we have the spatial constraints from the EDSD map, we can plot the misorientations of each pixel relative to a reference orientation. And in this particular map, it's given by the star here. Um, so you can see the darker colors or the, the more red colors are the higher angle um, misorientations. We're ignoring the axis part and we're just looking at the angle now. And again, within, within the grain where the star is, um, it's all yellow, which is telling us it's all a fairly uniform orientation. As we go across these lines, which are, are, our, are our boundaries, we see discontinuous changes in the orientation. And that's because we, we're going across the boundaries. We can also treat this whole data set uh, as one population and plot up the angle distribution of these uh, misorientations, again, ignoring the axes. We're just plotting the distribution of angles. And we can compare that to the, the theoretical random distribution. So if we had no structure to the data and we were just looking at random measurements, um, of orientation of, of this particular mineral, then we'd expect the histogram to match the black line. Um, and we can look at deviations from this and, and interpret those in terms of processes. So that's a, a kind of a, a quick three slide summary of, of, uh, of some of the ideas that we can, uh, that we can explore from the EBSD uh, maps. And so now we'll look at um, applying that to the idea of phase heritage, um, specifically in this case in zircons, and zircons that have been hit with meteorites. And so zircon is a very good geochronometer, and it's very good because it's very robust in, in many, um, many crustal and, uh, and even mantle conditions. However, when you hit it with a big rock from space, um, and subject it to pressures of tens of gigapascals and uh, several thousand degrees, it, even, even zircon begins to suffer a bit. And we see a whole bunch of different, um, different features, some of which we see in tectonically deformed minerals, um, like uh, we see twins and, and low angle grain boundaries and recrystallization occurs. But we also see, um, like is shown here um, in this, we get the uh, phase change to redite, which is the high pressure polymorph of, of zircon. And we see the, zir the zircons under the most extreme circumstances start becoming disaggregated. And it's these things that we were interested in uh, looking at this, um, this work. And this is published in a, a paper um, by with Nick Timms and others in, in Earth Science Reviews. So let's, um, and I'm, I'm talking about zircon here um, because it's, it's an interesting chemical system. Um, and the, because of the applications of zirconia in high temperature um, kind of uh, industrial applications, the, the phase relations are relatively well known. So let's look at the, the phase diagram for zircon. So on the left, we have the phase diagram and we'll kind of wander around across that. Um, and on the right, we've got a picture of uh, some zircon, a zircon grain, along with one of these pole figures, the, the stereographic uh, projection of these axes. And we'll track what happens as we go around the phase diagram. So we start off with zircon, we heat it up during the impact event, and the first thing that happens is the zircon dissociates. So it breaks down into zirconia, uh, zirconium oxide, and silica. silica oxide. If we continue to heat it up, um, we lose the silica. And so we head over to the left hand side of the phase diagram because we're now just considering zirconia, no longer zircon. And the, um, if we heat it to the, the highest temperatures before it melts, we can actually crystallize a, a cubic phase of zirconia. It's used in, in jewelry. And on the diagram on the right hand side, we can see some orientations of, 
cubics of cone here, you'll notice that these axes are all labeled the same, and that's because they are symmetric equivalent. We can't distinguish between these axes. So we've got a bunch of cubic zirconias over here. When we start cooling this down after the impact event, we go into the tetragonal zirconia field. And so I've just put, I've just stopped at an arbitrary temperature here. But as we transform from cubic to tetragonal zirconia, we see that the crystallography actually starts controlling uh, what happens. And the and what happens is we nucleate new grains of tetragonal zirconia at the expense of the cubic, the cubic phase, but we don't nucleate these new grains in random orientations because there's actually an, uh, an energy advantage to nucleating in specific, um, specific directions. And the, the relationships are, are governed by the crystallography. So for each cubic zirconia that we had, we can nucleate three possible orientations of tetragonal zirconia. If we cool down the, the um, if we cool down the zirconia a bit more, then we go over another another boundary in the in the phase map, and the tetragonal zirconia actually transforms to a monoclinic phase, which is Bradelli, which is the usual form that we observe in, in rocks. Once again, we go through this phase transformation and we don't nucleate Bedelliite in random orientations. We actually um, nucleate it again according to the crystallographic relationships between, um, between the monoclinic and the tetragonal phase. And so for each tetragonal zirconia that we had, we get four possible monoclinic orientations which means we have 12 possible orientations for every cubic frame that we had. And these form nice patterns of orientations on the, on the stereonet. So we can see, even though it seems quite overwhelming, we can actually see there's some order and structure to this data. And um, this is what we're going to apply um, to try and understand some of the microstructures. This is all, um, again, summarized in the in the same paper in the um, EPSL. So here's an example um, of, of a zircon. And so the zircon's the, the bit in the middle, and it's been plopped into some um, impact melt. And it's begun to dissociate because it's such a high temperature. And we've got we've got what is now a deliite rim around the edge. And you can see it's all a bit chaotic and, and there's not much structure to the, the colors here and again the same on the, with the pole figure however if we apply those arguments that we've just been through to look at uh, potential um, clusters of, of orientations that may relate to one another um, such as this cluster down here there doesn't there's not much pattern there's quite a lot of this kind of uh, fleshy buff color um, but actually um, not, not a lot else in terms of the structure. But when we plot up the data, we can see it actually has structure to it. And so we can use these arguments to reconstruct patches of now Bedelliite grains that we believe came from the original cubic grains. And the data is a lot more structured. And so by applying these arguments, we can look at what phases we've previously had um, and how these, have, how these are now manifested in the, in the remaining microstructure. So if we apply that idea to look at um, minerals in ore deposits, you can see that even when we go through some quite extreme um, conditions, such as those experienced during the meteorite impact, or in terms of the ore deposits, maybe highly corrosive fluids that we see in the epithermal gold deposits, or just the extreme alteration that we often get associated with high fluid fluxes, we can potentially start decoding um, what the path that the, the minerals have been down and unraveling what, um, for example, trace elements may be uh, moving around. So here's an example uh, from the junction ore deposit in the gold fields of Western Australia. And here we have an ilmenite 
uh, crystal. So that's shown in this phase map. Each phase is a different color, which is shown in blue. Um, and it's actually a nice large needle of ilmenite. And it's breaking down to the green phase, anatase, which is, is TiO2. And it's breaking down to the red phase, rutile, which is also TiO2. So they're two polymorphs, and we can distinguish them um, because they have different crystallography. The, the um, iron is lost during this breakdown reaction, and that volume loss is taken up by infilling dolomite kind of forms this, is this yellow phase that fills in the, in the gaps. If we just look at the relationship between the ilmenite and the rutile now, we can see from the, the pole figure that we have the cluster of OO1s and the three, um, the three one one, uh, bar one, bar one, two zero A axes. Um, so we have a single crystal of, of ilmenite. And once again, the rutile orientations, even though the grains are spread out along the, the margins of the, the rutile, of the ilmenite, actually have some structure to the data. So they all share the 100 zero zero axes. And because rutile is tetragonal, they have two symmetry equivalent 100 zero zero axes. And so that's why we have a red blob here and a red blob here. The green blob overlies the, the red blob here and we have a, a red one up there. And it's relatively straightforward to see that this uh, pole figure here matches quite nicely. The same orientations as the ilmenite. So we have a very strong crystallographic correspondence. As a slight aside, although we'll come back to it later, the, if we look at the orientation of the dolomite that's in filling the gaps and plot that um, this orientation between the dolomite and the ilmenite uh, needle, they're both, they're both the same um, crystal symmetry. Um, we can see that a lot of the dolomite actually is kind of within 20 degrees of the orientation of the ilmenite needle. So that's suggesting that the, the, the crystallography of the ilmenite is actually um, having some influence over the dolomite that's in filling the gaps, even though they share very little in terms of chemistry. So we can deduce these relationships, and this is just a figure here to show the relationship between the, uh, the ilmenite in pink and the three symmetric equivalents uh, rutiles to perform. Interestingly, the anatase here is all a single crystallographic orientation um, and doesn't show very strong correspondence to anything um, within the ilmenite. How does this relate to mineralization? Well, these are some pictures from, um, the, from the Athena deposit at, at St. Ives in Eastern Goldfields. And we can see that gold is actually um, found within some of these sites where this reaction is occurring. So we've got ilmenite um, breaking down um, to the TiO2 phase. And I'm not entirely sure which one this is in this particular image. And we've got gold forming in some of those spaces. We also have gold related to this, um, this pore space in the mica as well. Again, we'll come back to that later. Here's a, another image, and you can see the kind of threefold um, multiplicity of the, these needles of rutile in here. Um, in, in, even though it's very fine grain, these are kind of submicron crystals. We're getting gold forming in growing in these in the pore spaces. We also have a third polymorph of TiO2 brookite forming at the same time as the um, as the rutile. So these reactions are apparently intimately related with, with gold mineralization. And so if we investigate these polymorphs a little bit more, um, this is this is another microstructure. Um, uh, actually from the same part, the same thin section as, as this uh, previous one, where we have polycrystalline ilmenite is shown in yellow, and we actually have all three polymorphs of, of TiO2 forming um, within this microstructure. So um, there, there's kind of a common, commonly accepted um, view that 
that um, anatase is the low temperature form of, of uh, TiO2 and the rutile uh, forms at much higher temperatures. Um, but this is a, a sample from, uh, from deep drill core, which has seen no low temperature kind of uh, weathering or overprint. And actually, we've got all three polymorphs um, present in this, in this, just this one field of view, not even in the same thing section, in the same kind of field of view on the SEM. And so I would strongly challenge that kind of that view. And that has implications for uh, how we use these accessory phases in terms of exploration. Um, so rutile is, has, has been found um, to, to contain trace elements, which can be used as, as vectors towards ore deposits. And uh, Diana Plabs's work um, at, at Curtin has shown quite nicely that um, we can take uh, from the same sample, thing, anatase and rutile and anatase and brookite, and we have quite a variation in the contents of the, um, the key elements that we use as pathfinders for this, um, this heavy mineral-based e exploration vector. So there is a bit of a kind of buyer beware in terms of using this technique as to making sure you have the right phases and understanding what phases you have before you look at the geochemistry. So a second example of, of using these relationships to unravel um, what has previously been around in, in ore deposits um, is, is, is shown here from the, the Productora um, copper gold um, deposit from South America. And we have throughout this rock these, um, these patches of, of TiO2. This is a sample that uh, Ange Eskholm at Coes provided uh, me to have a look at. Um, and we have, you can see they kind of have you fairly unhedral shapes, but they're made up of this fine grained um, TiO2. It's actually rutile in this case. And they have a whole bunch of other accessory minerals um, in them. So the question here was what are these pseudomorphs of? And are they going to um, affect things like? The, the magnetism. So if they're pseudomorphs of, of magnetite or titanomagnetite, then the reaction to rutile is actually going to affect the magnetic properties of the rocks. And um, if they're ilmenite, uh, less so. Can we unravel what, what these minerals actually were? And the title of this slide somewhat gives it away, um, but it's a, it's a little bit more interesting than you may first think in the when we look at the orientations of these rutile grains in this cluster here, we have two sets that are quite nicely um, picked out by the different colors. And if we split those two sets up and plot the pole figures separately, we can see that same relationship with the one zero zero direction shared and the 60 degree um, rotation. So this threefold multiplicity that we see with the ilmenite in both subsets. But the, but the two subsets have different, orient, different orientations, but they're not independent. They are actually linked. They share this same uh, one zero zero direction over here. And um, we can actually look at things like twins in the original ilmenite and say, okay, if we have a, an original ilmenite that has a twin in it, um, for example, that, that we know the twin law of, because those are crystallographically controlled as well, um, what would we expect the daughter rutiles um, to actually look like? So we can kind of play the same game that we played with the zirconia and, um, and test our model ideas against, against reality. So here are these misorientation angle distributions. We're interested in the red one. This is the random pairs of measurements. So we're looking at pairs between the two subsets and within the two subsets. And this gives us this right, spiky distribution. And if we assume that it, there's the uh, uh, one, one, uh, one, zero, one, two twin in the, uh, in the ilmenite, then we would expect peaks at these different angles. This just looks at the angles and you can see it matches quite nicely the peaks in the red histogram. Um, 
we can also take into account the axes. So if we plot this in 3D as um, the distance from the origin is the angle and the orientation, um, it's kind of a polar plot where the, the, the direction, the position in 3D is the, um, gives, the position in 3D gives us the axis and the distance from the origin gives us the angle. Um, once again, we can plot the data, it is plotted in as the blue dots, and we can plot the modeled um, orientations that we'd expect from our theoretical um, distribution. And we can see that it matches very nicely when we consider both the angles and the axes. So we have a fair degree of confidence that we're looking at a twinned Ilmenite grain that's now completely replaced by the user. So if we look at this second example, here we have rutile in, in yellow. It's got this kind of triangular outline that's picked out by muscovite. So we might hypothesize that it's potentially a triangular section through a, a cubic mineral, maybe titanium magnetite. Again, here are the orientations. There's some kind of some structure to it, but um, there's a lot of variability. When we actually plot up the directions, it's a little bit confusing but we can contour these directions. And we actually see that there are some symmetry elements that we would expect from the cubic mineral. So we have a six-fold uh, six symmetry in the 001 directions. We have three-fold symmetry in the, the 100 and 110, we've got kind of three clusters, and we have a four-fold symmetry in the 100. So this is suggesting that maybe it has come from a, a titanium magnetite. Again, there have been several orientation relationships. So instead of just having one set of known relationships between parents and daughters, um, there have been several that have been suggested in the literature, and we can actually test which one um, fits our data. So if we if we model the misorientation angle distribution for the two different relationships, then we end up with two big peaks for number one and a set of smaller peaks for number two. Again, we look at the red graph here, um, we can see that the peaks match very nicely the, the green orientate, the green, the green option. Plotting the data in 3D to take into account the angles and the axes. Um, we, we match very nicely the, the clusters with the green uh, dots um, and not so much with the red one. So we can we can say which of the two hypothetical um, replacement relationships uh, is actually controlled in the data here, and that yes, it was a cubic um, titanium magnetite. So now we'll we'll kind of move on and look at um, the influence of of epitaxial growth. So one one mineral growing on another and the control that that um, that, that exerts. Before we do that. Um, I'll we'll look at this diagram of mineral systems, um, which works very nicely in conceptualizing uh, how mineral systems uh, kind of work. And um, we put a lot of time and effort into this understanding this uh, kind of red circle here with our ore, ore deposit models and how things are trapped, how things are deposited. And there are many, many options for how these how the minerals are how minerals are deposited depending on what type of mineral deposit you've got. You can have fluid mixing, fluid rock reactions, phase separation, boiling, depressurization, uh, and all kinds of all kinds of other things. But actually, all of these processes provide us with a driving force for precipitation of the minerals from the fluid. So um, we, we change the properties of of the fluid and um, in, in all these models, that, that is the key controlling stage. Things just precipitate. So, for example, if we react a, a gold-bearing uh, sulfidic fluid with iron in the wall rocks, we precipitate uh, pyrite, and we, we also precipitate the gold. And that's, that's kind of how the, um, how the, the gold deposit forms. None of those models or none of those ideas take into account the, the actual nucleation of the, the, um, the minerals themselves and, 
and what control um, the rock microstructures and the minerals that are present uh, potentially have on whereabouts that, that nucleation occurs. And I suppose that's evolved because many of these systems are seen as uh, extremely oversaturated and therefore uh, homogeneous nucleation is, is not necessarily a problem. But, so we've considered the driving forces and what if we do think about things like nucleation and growth? Um, what, what Denis Fubu's um, published some work a, a, a few years ago in American Mineralogist where he was looking at gold trapped in the Arsenal Pyrite using atom probe data um, and whether it was clustered or uniformly distributed. And he thought about exactly these kinds of things, surface, uh, surface processes and the growth of the Arsenal Pyrite relative to the gold and can explain the distribution of, of the arsenic pyrite within, within the gold and the patterns that he sees by thinking about these mechanisms. So I think they certainly deserve a lot more thought than we necessarily do. So here's a, an XRF map um, of a, a sample, again, from Junction. Um, and the, those of you who are keen of eye will notice that this iron bearing phase is quite needly um, is actually the ilmenite needle we were looking at earlier. And this is the, the edge of a quartz vein. We have some gold shown in red precipitated here and within the biotype. And the gold is associated with this uh, blue rubidium. So that's uh, where the biotite is being altered to muscovite. Muscovite takes in rubidium uh, preferentially. And once again, there's control of, of the trace elements on what minerals are present. And so if we look at this in detail, um, this is just a, a blow up of the, this, this field of blue over here on the right hand side. We can see that we've got um, biotite breaking down to chlorite and muscovite associated with the, the precipitation of gold. We've got um, iron, magnesium carbonates and, and rutile as well being precipitated. So the, the gold is quite intimately associated with the, the reaction front between the, um, the parent biotite and the, the daughter rutiles and muscovites. Um, so what, what is controlling this? You'll notice in that field of view the, the complete lack of sulfide, even though the, at the larger scale there's a, a sulfidic halo around many of these uh, veins in this deposit. So now if we look at the crystal orientations of the gold and the, the mica in, from some of these fields of view, um, we actually notice a conspicuous similarity between the 100, sorry, 111 faces of the, the gold and the basal planes of the mica. So that's the, the sheets of the, the mica grains. Um, and we can explain that because they both these both have a, a hexagonal symmetry. So the this, that's shown on the, the right hand side. The the one 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 plane is the hexagonally closed packed plane in the gold, and it has a, a nice hexagonal arrangement in the same way that um, the atoms do on the the mica um, the mica sheets. Once again, we can look at and see if this is actually a kind of statistically um, robust uh, uh, relationship by actually quantifying quantifying what we're seeing. Here we have that gold from the edge of the quartz vein associated with the mica here. You can see in the, in the image the, the nice uh, platy uh, mica grains. And here's our distribution. This is our theoretical random, the blue line. And if we plot up all the gold um, misorientations, with respect to the mica, we actually see a big peak, but this is dominated by these large grains. So we can take one point per gold grain, and we still see this low angle um, overabundance of what we'd expect um, uh, if we compared it to, to the random situation. We can compare these two distributions uh, using a kolmogorov smirnov test, and um, this, this gap here is, is compared against a test of significance and is actually um, found to be that there's a significant um, significant chance that the, the 
observed distribution is not derived from the random uh, population. So we, we can say that the, the mica is exerting a control on, um, on the gold growth. And that actually the, the mica nucleation or the nucleation of gold on the mica surfaces is potentially localizing the gold in areas where we have both porosity creation for the, for the gold to grow and the reaction to, to muscovite. So even though we may be transporting the gold um, in a sulfidic fluid, the final location of the gold is, is controlled by these micro reactions and not necessarily by the, the breakdown of the, the sulfide complexes. So to sum up all, all the things that I've said, um, I think the crystal structure controls the fundamental rock properties. Um, it's very important in terms of both geophysics and geochemistry, and, and we should pay attention, especially when we're trying to understand whether our exploration tools are working as we expect them to, or in understanding why maybe something hasn't worked as well as we, we think it should have. We can understand uh, microstructures beyond just uh, qualitative observations, I mean, EBSD is a good way to do that. And we can use relationships between uh, phases to say a lot about the, the history of the rock and the phases that have been present. And I would, it's something I'm interested in and, and pursuing further, but the idea is that, that nucleation and the controls on nucleation actually uh, provide a fundamental control on where we find the grade within a, a particular deposit. I will leave you with my thanks and my contribution to the this Twitter Stones at Home um, kind of collection of beautiful rocks, which is um, which is quartz that's replaced calcite blades from a, an epithermal deposit in New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. We'll stop the recording now. And if anyone has